is by keeping interest rates, the amount you get charged when you take out a loan or take out a mortgage, take out a car loan, anything like that, interest rates high. When they keep those high, it fights inflation. But they want to cut. So more precisely, what central banks do in order to raise interest rates is they sell government bonds and conversely the way that they increase uh, decrease interest rates is by buying government bonds so they they create the money out of thin air electronically in order to purchase government bonds this increases the money supply and that's the reason why low interest rates are inflationary is because they're creating money in order to buy these government bonds so there's more money in the economy now there's more money in the money supply and so money becomes relatively less valuable or uh, expensive to make the economy go boom, you know, to juice things for the election. I mean, Biden's practically demanding it, bro. He, he keeps saying, we'll get those rates down. And I hope Jerome Powell holds, holds tough. I hope he doesn't do it. Who is Jerome Powell? You may not know his name, but you know how he rolls. He's this guy, Jerome Powell, head of the Federal Reserve, Mr. Money Printer. It's funny, so much of our lives are affected by this man. <laughs> that many people don't even know. This guy is, I mean, so much of our lives is affected by the choices this guy makes. It's crazy. I don't remember voting for him. You don't. That's the crazy part. He's appointed. The president cannot force the Fed to lower rates, though there is a long history going back to even like Arthur Burns of presidents strongly pushing for a rate lowering and then getting it in an election year. Can you elaborate on how raising interest impact inflation is because people don't buy and spend as much? Yes. Yeah, it's supposed to put like a raking effect on the economy. Cool the animal spirits of people taking out debt to buy and speculate on things. For example. So there's a lot of misinformation around inflation. And part of that's because central bankers don't want people to understand that inflation is just the government creating money in order to erode the the value of their debt and, and to finance deficits and part of the issue is the changing definition of inflation inflation historically has meant an increase in prices as a result of of an expansion of the money supply whereas today it's more commonly used to mean an increase in prices the problem with defining inflation as simply an increase in prices is that prices can increase for many reasons so it, it makes sense to have a term that is allocated to prices increasing simply because of inflation as opposed to prices increasing um, because demand for a particular good increases but there's a lot of the don't look at the man behind the curtain mythology surrounding central banks and the way they function inflation in the money supply very few people understand uh, how bad inflation is and all the negative consequences that, that come from it. It's not simply that prices go up because we just go up to you and that sort of balances out in the long run, etc., etc. But actually, there, there's uh, a lot, a lot more severe problems. So, for one thing, you're robbing savers of the wealth of their savings uh, we, we all know that say inflation's at three percent your hundred dollars in the bank is going to be worth only 97 dollars uh, in last year's money next year so where does that three dollars go it goes to 
whoever is creating the new money, which in this case is the central bank. In, in America, that's the Federal Reserve. So it's actually very accurate to think of it as a tax. It's a tax on savers. And this is very unfair. Uh, it, it, it makes no sense to to tax people based on how much they save. It's also a very bad policy because savings is very important for the economy. That's how long-term economic growth happens. People save money and then that money gets invested usually by a bank um, or a bank lending out money uh, to companies. They use that money to buy stuff for their businesses, capital, and that enables their businesses to produce more, to hire more people, etc., etc. Now, now, they like to say that lowering interest rates stimulates the economy, stimulates economic activity. And this is sort of true. Like, it's true based on the metrics which people use to measure the economy. Stimulus makes GDP go up. But it's not really true. It's not true if you understand how the economy works and how the economy grows. So not every type of economic activity is necessarily good. I guess an obvious example of this would be war. Take the Iraq war. We spent $2 trillion in the Iraq war. That's a lot of economic activity. But what do you have as a result of it? You know, you could have built two trillion dollars worth of homes and factories and stuff that would still be there instead you go off and and uh, spend two trillion dollars uh, to patrol a particular spot in the desert for a while so it seems obvious to me that if you spent two trillion dollars on more productive activities like uh, like building factories or even hospitals and schools or roads or really anything that people need in their day-to-day -day life or to go about their their business, then that would be better for, for the economy. Or let's take another example. Let's say, um, okay, let's say a trillion dollars was spent building factories that produce chess sets. Okay, well, this would probably be a bad idea uh, because there's just not that much demand for chess sets. There's a decent demand for chess sets, but it's probably already being met um, more or less by by the current setup of production. So what you would have is a whole bunch of chess sets that nobody wants to buy, right? So that's economic activity. That's not necessarily a good thing because it doesn't match consumer demand. What people really want is new tiles for their kitchen or new washing machines or more houses or more apartment buildings or any of the million things that people want. Um, so it's important for production to be aligned with consumer demand. That's the whole point of the economy. You produce stuff that people want to buy with their salaries, right? So what happens when the government lowers interest rates through purchase through the, through the Federal Reserve creating or the central bank creating money out of thin air and then essentially loaning it to the government by by buying these these government bonds is this lowers interest rates because there's a greater supply of loanable funds so credit becomes artificially cheap and this this is a price signal that that mimics a lengthening in time preference or a, a lowering of time preference so time preference is the degree to which people want things today versus the degree to which people want things tomorrow. An individual that has a high time preference wants to spend today. Um, for example, 
a high time preference individual might go to a really nice steakhouse, get a really nice steak. They take the taxi, not the bus. They uh, run up debt on their credit card. They spend their whole paycheck. They don't save. They're, they're thinking more of today. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's uh, individual subjective preference. You know, they could get hit by a bus tomorrow and die. And uh, turns out they were right. I'm not saying they are right. I mean, it's it's for any everybody's individual decisions to make, you know, based on their own value scale. A low time preference individual might uh, might scrimp and save and, and try to save up as much money so in the future, you know, they can retire safely, leave something for their kids, whatever. So if people are saving more money and spending less, because in order to save you have to not spend, then this would mean that there's, relatively speaking, a greater demand for capital goods industries than consumer goods industries. That is, people are going to want more stuff tomorrow than they are today, so resources should be, in order to be in accordance with consumer demand, should be shifted from um, producing consumer goods, stuff that people would use today, into uh, more long-term aspects of the structure of production. So instead of building cars, uh, they might build tractors. Or instead of growing crops in a field, a farmer might leave that field fallow. There's just things that entrepreneurs can do um, to produce more later than, than today. You could upgrade your machinery at the cost of some downtime, you know, for example. So the interest rate in a market economy is determined by the degree of consumer savings. So there's more savings, there's more loanable funds, uh, interest rates go down, and, uh, and entrepreneurs invest more in capital goods industries. And this same sort of change in entrepreneurial investment areas is caused by artificially low interest rates uh, from the expansion of bank credit uh, under uh, w which is what happens with with uh, the Federal Reserve um, borrowing or uh, purchasing government bonds lowering interest rates uh, creating money out of thin air and, and lending money to the government so that's the really um, most pernicious effect of inflation is it causes the boom-bust business cycle by, by yes, it stimulates the economy, but the way the economy is stimulated means that, that investments are, are uh, factors of production are producing the wrong stuff. It's not stuff that people actually want to buy. And so uh, sooner or later, those investments are going to have to be liquidated. They'll be found out to be money-losing and they have to be liquidated. So this whole process is very counterproductive and, and uh, wasteful. If a house costs a million bucks and you can't really afford it, but it's really cheap to borrow, okay, you borrow. And then you bid 1.1 million and the, the prices start to rise. But if it's expensive to borrow, all of a sudden, now you're less likely to take out that loan. Things slow down a bit. It's supposed to put a, a, a breaking effect on the economy. But uh, everyone loves when rates are low. It juices everything. Stock prices go up. Housing prices go up. That's the whole thing. If they cut rates, how high can inflation rate? We don't know. Nobody even knows if it will. But that is my belief. And the heart of hearts is that if they break down and they cut rates, which they'll probably be forced to do. Actually, I know they're going to. I mean, <laughs> they're going to do it this year, bro. They're going to cut rates. Even though we still have sticky inflation and even though unemployment is still nominally low. They're going to cut rates, which is crazy. And when they do it, I think we're going to see a spike uh, in asset prices and we're going to see inflation come roaring back at higher levels. And I, I feel uncomfortable with that. We need Paul Volcker. Yeah, I, I think so. I think they're going to cut cut rates. And I think that's, that's going to have some negative consequences. The other thing um, about the, the whole business cycle thing is that Raising interest rates helps the problem because it brings the the interest rate more along the line of consumer demand. 
Volker is the GOAT. If you guys don't know who this is, Paul Volker is the fucking, this fucking dude, this cigar smoking motherfucker, head of the Federal Reserve way back in the fucking 80s? Am I the crazy? 70s? 